have seen this occur in your life, well, you know, you rejoice to be the new man. You rejoice in newness of life, in purity of heart, in the white robes of righteousness in Christ. You rejoice in those things because his commandments are not burdensome. His yoke is easy. His burden is light. He wants to lead us to eternal life. So how can the Holy Spirit then be dwelling in this person that's living in these addictions and slavery to sin, falling back into their vomit all the time? See, it's impossible. It's absolutely impossible. Well, Romans 5.12 says we're born in... No, Romans 5.12 does not say that. You only think it says that because it's been ingrained into your brains for so long. Yeah, sin came into the world, the occasion of sin through the one man, Adam, and then all died physically, all are subject to physical death as the curse through that, because all sin, not all sinned in Adam, because you followed his example. So the will is always present, but the will to perform he finds not throughout these scriptures where they use the sin nature fallacy. So that willingness, that determined purpose and resolve, which, meet, which is will in the Bible, if any man will come after me, let him take up his cross. So that will has to be directed, that resolve, that determination towards God before you can break free from this. That's why he says, who's going to set me free from this? Well, Christ Jesus, right? He says, that's the reason for the law of the Spirit and the life in Christ has set me free from what? From all this mess, the law of sin and death. Why? The law of sin and death is the curse of the law, whereby I was under the condemnation of the law. The full penalty of that can be remitted by the blood of Christ, if I will come and meet his conditions in repentance. Not trust, not faith alone, not repeat after me, not going up to the altar call and, and uh, shedding a few tears of sincerity where you're really not going to break free from your sins. No, a willingness and a desire and a resolve. Like he says, to having done all, stand, to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. See, if there's no willingness to overcome these evil desires, then there's going to be no redemption. So if there's nothing good dwelling in me, if you've got that in your head and you think that's the Christian life, well then you're never going to come clean with God. You're never going to find any of that redemption. See, the choice here. See, it's just like James talks about. He says, when the, when the desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when it's full grown, it brings forth death. See, so it's the choice. It's when the desire unites with the will, with the resolve, then you've committed the transgression. Whether it's the lust of the eye whether it's the lust of the flesh, whether it's the pride of life, you've committed the transgression. So it's not birthed in you, it gives birth. He says, he says in that James passage, he says, you know, when the sin is full grown, he says, when the desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. Sin's not birthed in you, you give birth to it when the desire, the evil, the lust is conceived in your mind, you're taken captive, enticed, the word entice they use in that scripture mean you're taken captive, just like he says here, I'm, I'm in captivity to this because I've given myself over to my lusts and desires and the only way to break free from this is through the blood of Christ in repentance and faith proven by deeds. In the metaphorical understanding he's talking about here is the captivity of the, where the Romans would take captive their prisoners after they in, in, besieged the city and they built their ramparts and, their, and they dug their ditches and all around it. They starved them out. And then they'd go in there and take the prisoners, the rest of the people that survived, and they'd bring them into this bitter captivity of chains, kind of like being chained to a corpse and having to drag that corpse around until the rotting stench of it killed you. Well, it's the same illustration or metaphorical understanding of you being in slavery to sin. You're dragging around this corpse of sin and death, saying it's your nature, saying you're the Roman's wretch, saying you're, you're, you're desperately wicked and filthy rags, until it destroys you and you fall into the pit like lemmings. So it's the same illustration. That's, that's exactly what he's talking about here in, in, at the end of the chapter where the captivity where he says that the very opposite of that in the 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5 passage where it says bringing every thought into the captivity of Christ. That same captivity. 
that same grabbing it and grasping it and bringing every thought, every high thing that exalts itself against God, every argument to cast it down <clears throat> and to bring it into the captivity of Christ. So the choice is made, whether you want to believe it or not, you made the choice to sell yourself into the slavery of sin. You've given yourself over to the wretched man, to the desperately wicked heart, to the filthy rags. And I say, well, under that condition, how could you trust anybody that's the wretched man with a desperately wicked heart? And the preachers are constantly in the pulpit calling themselves desperately wicked, saying that you're the wretched man and you're going to sin every day in thought, word, and deed. Well, that makes you all liars, cheats, drunks, reprobates, and everything else. How could I trust anything you say? How could I shake hands with you in a business deal and be confident that you're going to carry it through? Well, obviously I couldn't because you don't know the difference between right and wrong. You have a desperately wicked heart. Well, how can a desperately wicked heart even know the difference between right and wrong? You see how foolish that doctrine is? So you know the difference between right and wrong. And it's your choice to do either. And a lot of times you choose to do what's right because you don't want to go to jail. You don't want to violate the law and end up behind bars or with a huge fine or with a record so you can't get a job. So you do what's right. Some out of selfish motivation, surely, but nevertheless, if you can do what's right there, you can do what's right towards God and come clean with Him. And until you realize that, it's never going to happen in your life. It's never going to happen. You'll always be the wretched man. You'll always be in this captivity. There'll always be this war in your body, the flesh versus the spirit, and the spirit versus the flesh, and you're held and you don't know what to do. Well, you can be set free. It says you crucify the flesh. Remember passions, evil passions and desires? Not the, you don't drive nails through your hands and feet. Crucify those evil passions and desires with Christ. The old man was crucified, it says in Romans 6.4. Was. Done. Done deal, not to be repeated in repentance. That's why you can't crucify Christ over and over again. That's why you can't trample the blood by constantly sinning and confessing and pleading the blood all the time. Those, people, those preachers that are teaching you that are teaching you to trample the blood and insult the Spirit. That's why I get so many p desperate emails from people that have come to a lightened understanding. They read those Hebrews 6 and t uh, 10 passages, and they're scared to death that they've, I've been doing that. Well, yeah, in principle you have, but you were never sanctified by that blood. So you trampled it, yes, you trampled that knowledge and that light that was given you by not seeking after more light and coming clean. So the principle applies, and that's why the, the, hor the horrible foreboding is in, under conviction in your conscience. But nevertheless, if, if a Christian, if a real redeemed born-again person did that, their situation would be dire indeed and recovery may be impossible <clears throat> although there is some possibility of a person recovering from that but it's not an easy thing so how can you have a pure heart be pure as he is pure do what's right and you're righteous as he is righteous keeping the law of faith, have the white robes of righteousness with the righteous acts of the saints, be raised to newness of life, have all things that pertain to life and godliness, the exceeding great and precious promises, be partakers of the divine nature, escape the corruptions in the world through lust, and still be the wretched man, and still be in bondage. See, it's absolutely impossible. It's absolutely impossibility. It's foolishness. It's absolute foolishness to put yourself under these doctrines because they've been taught you for so long. Paul even said in other scriptures, and he says, you are witnesses and God also, how devoutly and justly and blamelessly behaved among, ourselves, among you who believed, and how we exhorted each one of you to be comforted and charged every one of you as a father does his own children. 1 Thessalonians 2, 10 and 11. Uh, Acts 24, 16. Is that being so, I have always strived to have my conscience without offense towards God and man. Acts 24, 16. Uh, invitate me as I invitate Christ. 1 Corinthians 11, 1. We gave no offense in anything that our ministry might not be blamed, and in all things commend ourselves as ministers of Christ in God. 2 Corinthians 6, 3 and 4. 
It's just a few verses where Paul testifies of having a good conscience, conducting himself blamelessly and devoutly towards the brethren. Now, how could he be teaching them this garbage, that they were wretched man, and he was the wretched man and the chief of sinners, if he was saying these things also? Invitate me as I invitate Christ. Was well, Christ the wretched man? Is Christ the chief of sinners? Is Christ going to lead you anywhere but to a pure heart and a newness of life and white right robes of righteousness? No, of course he's not. So you invitate Christ and you'll find newness of life. Have your conscience clear before God and man and you can walk in uprightness in this world today. As vile as it is, you can be defiled by this world just by taking part in your daily life and your workaday life. That's why you need to keep in the word, add to your faith, guard your heart, strive. To, that's why you've got to do those things, to keep yourself pure so that the world does not defile you. So we're admonished time and time again to do these things in the scriptures, to always be following Christ, to always be ready, to always be able to be ready to present ourselves blameless without spot at his coming. That's the admonishment, so that we're not drawn into the error of the wicked. So I beseech you to dig down deep into the Scriptures and come to a proper, enlightened understanding through the Spirit, through the Holy Spirit, of what the Scriptures teach about righteousness and holiness in Christ.